Let's pray. Loving Father, we want to bless you once again this morning. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord. And as we come to share the word of God, the sword of the Spirit, the two-edged sword, we pray that, Lord, you guide us, you, Lord, spare us from the spirit of error, mm. open our understanding, and you strengthen us. Amen. By the Holy Spirit, we pray mm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The, the person, the person, P U Z Z N E, the person, of the faith. Faith <coughs> dilemma. The puzzle of the faith dilemma. Throughout this teaching, words such as puzzle, dilemma, dichotomy, or even contrast may be used interchangeably. In reference to the problem of inner conflict, occurring within believers in God. <laughs> there is a conflict in a believer's heart. Question. If God is almighty and owns the whole universe, why aren't things any easier? in particular for believers. We see this conflict in the life of Job. I call that the most humanly spiritual book. It's human. You see a real person. You don't see someone who is pretending. It's so serious. He fears God, but he's not pretending. He's not saying, I'm, I'm strong, you know, this is, uh, you know, I'm strong. I'm strong. No. This is someone who has a real problem, a real conflict. Throughout the book, you see this conflict on display. Well, God, you say yourself, I'm your servant you say I shun from evil you say I'm blameless and upright by God's standards that's God's declaration about Job yeah. but what is this then and on top of that godly people come and say well bad things happen to bad people mm. well that adds misery to Job his trust doesn't understand. But inwardly, by God's standard, he's approved of God. And socially speaking, he's helping the poor. So what's the problem? Job does not understand. But he does not curse God. He stops short. And he curses the day he was born. Deep conflict with him, within him. We see this conflict in the life of Job, whom God declared to be his servant with none like him on the earth, by God's standard. None like him on the earth, blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Job 1 8, by God's standard. You would expect. Everything just to, to be easier for him, you know, all the best. That's what we hear, don't we? Prosperity goes, but no God approves me, then, you know, gold, and etc. But here you are, you have an ultimate example of God approved man. Yet you will go through a terrible experience that in itself should teach us. Not just the mosquito bite us, the devil has done it again. It's all about the devil now. God has no influence, no impact. It's all about the devil. 
a lady cooking in the kitchen, the spoon falls down, it's him again. <laughs> it's all about the devil. You read the book of Job and see how many times you refer to the devil. Even what is happening to him, he attributes to God, but without sinning. Yet there was an intense and same battle going on. And God wanted to demonstrate that people can love him. In French we say, envers et contre tout. Despite, in spite, through it all, they can love God. Say, so how is it because of what you've given to him? He said, really? Let's try it. Go, take everything except his life. Let's see what happened. Job did not know what was happening. The Bible concludes that in all things, Job did not charge God, did not sin. By the time we get to the New Testament, the Bible says, consider Job's life and the intended purpose, outcome. Well, we are in a very privileged position today. We know the fullness of the story of Job. So we have the material. We know that things happen. But guess what? Our life, someone said, is like a piece of paper in your Bible. You close the Bible, you put in all those very old fashioned leather and you zip it. Our life is hidden in Christ and God. One want to take our life? Go and take it in heaven because that's where our life is sitting in Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about the devil, the exaggeration of glorifying the devil in the believer's life. Is it Christ reigning or is the devil? Who has the final say in your life? Mm -hmm. Well, but false prophets are making a lot of money out of that because once you scare people. You divert their attention from God. It's all about the devil. The devil acts in so many ways. So many ways. But we have to focus on God to grow, to deepen in the truth of God. That's the only hope. Okay. Quite a long reading today. It's not long, it's only 28 verses. Let's read. Our main script today is Psalm 73. And I'm reminding the title, The Puzzle of the Faith Dilemma. Psalm chapter 73. A Psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my step had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 4. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as their necklace. necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. Verse 8. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Verse 10. Therefore his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. Verse 11. And they say, How does God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Verse 12. Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hand in innocence. Verse 14. For all day long I have been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, 
Behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me, verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood the end. Verse 18, surely you set them in slippery places, you cast them down to destruction. Verse 19, oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 27. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who deserve you for harlotry. Verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare you all your works. Amen. What are we going to do now? We're going to take these words of Asaph and we're going to try and put them in plain language. Let's see if we can make a bit more sense of that. Okay. Chapter 73, verse 1. Here is what Asaph is saying. No one can doubt that God is good to Israel. To such as are pure in heart. There's no question. There's no discussion about that. This is a, a known and established fact. This truth is so obvious that you may not think that anyone would even question that. That God is good. Verse 2. introduced himself in verse 1 and he continues in verse 2 but yes God is good no one can doubt, doubt that there's no question about this it's an established fact but okay God overall we know all is faithful with this right God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob we know that we know he delivered them by dry ground we know that But as for me, me is the problem. I know all that. I know all the good stories and testimony, but for me, I don't see that. Mm -hmm. Here is what Asaph is saying. And you will understand as we move forward in the passage, that he's looking back. He's talking in the is a past event. But there was a time in my life, that age of, when I began to wonder, and my stance of this truth felt shaky and wobbly. I was uh, feeling big on a sinking sand. the mind of Asaph. My faith almost dropped from verse 4 to verse 9. I was focusing on how well off the wicked one 
lot of money, plenty of pleasure, apparent trouble free life. I wish I was like them. Everything seemed to go their way. And they do not have as much physical suffering as believers do. The wicked seem to be able to afford the best of everything. They seem to be able to escape many troubles and tra tragedies. And even if trouble should strike them, they would have the best insurance cover against every conceivable form of loss. All shiny about them. They live in excessive luxury and they seem to be getting ever richer all the time. Then I began to question the rationality and the benefit of living decently, honestly, and responsibly and trusting God. What was the profit of spending time in prayer or studying the Word of God, helping the needy or actively testifying for the Lord? All I got for it had been a daily dose of increased suffering and the seeming punishment of, for being righteous and obeying God. I wonder if the life of faith was worth the cost. Seventy-three, verse 15, of course, I never shared my fear and doubt with other trusting believers. Mm -hmm. Let me just read that again. Verse 15, <clears throat> if I say I will speak thus, behold, I will have been untrue to the generation of your children. In other words. I never shared my fears and doubt with other trusting believers, lest I offend them and cause them to stumble. Mm. It's all happening in my heart. Mm. I display an outward facade of faith. It's all God inside. Notice the reason. Back to verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful. That's the key issue. Everything that's happening there is not because God has not answered prayer. It's not because God is not faithful. No, it's because I was envious. Mm. No reason, no excuses. It's all there. Nothing comes from outside that will defy us. It's the state of our heart, what is happening inside. Because of the state of our heart, in this particular case, envy was the problem. Then, I keep it secretly, I display a facade of believing. Because these people look godly. They look trusting God and will be offended. They will ostracize me. So let me just part, be part of the group. But I'm not winning it. And covetousness. Of who? Of the boastful and the wicked. Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful. <laughs> it was too painful. How can I suffer being the child of God to whom God and silver belong, who made the whole universe, Yahweh Rofeka? Why am I always so weak bodily, sick in pain? Nothing seems to work. How? Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful. 
I don't have an answer. Mm. In other words, I still cannot understand why and how the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer. It is so hard to understand. And the riddle is impossible to solve. Remember what the problem is? Envy and covetousness. Remember that. We sang earlier on, or to get the song, count the blessing one by one, and you will realize what the Lord has done. In French we say, count the bienfaits de Dieu, et tu verras, en l'adorant, combien le nombre en est grand. As you worship God, you will realize how big His blessing is. And you will see very quickly the problem with Asaph and how the puzzle was solved. Question. What was the real problem here? Although the human feeling could be deemed reasonable, but it was undoubtedly sustained by a carnal mind. The feeling is human. It's asking the right question, maybe, humanly speaking. But the underlying ground for that was a carnal mind. A carnal mindset. I call that wrong perception. Carnal relates to beast, bestiality. No spirit, no concept of God, is all flesh. That's what carnal is, like a beast. Perception was undoubtedly sustained by a carnal mind. Wrong perception and lack of spiritual understanding and discernment. He recognizes that God is good to such as have pure, a pure heart, but he deliberately chooses to become envious of the boastful when he saw the prosperity of the wicked. This is the main problem. In most believers' life, you find excuse upon excuse upon excuse upon excuse. This is the problem. Envy. Comparison. Covetousness. I think I'm doing pretty well. Christianity is wise, but how come I don't, you know, I'm an intercessor, how come, well, why that, you know, I'm better than that, that's a wretched, how come, I'm doing pretty well in the church, how come, God, just, mm. what's the problem? Mm. He became envious of what? Of the wicked, of the blasphemer. These people have no concept, no regard, no reference for God. They speak wickedly against the throne of God in heaven. Psalm 11, verse 4 God's throne is in heaven. When you speak badly, blasphemously about against heaven, you blaspheme God. These people have no reference, no respect. Openly, it's all about them. Pride is the necklace. Pride is the sign. Necklace. Pride. It's all about them. They're the creator of the universe. They have no reverence for God. And the godly person is now envious mm. of those people. Mm. Mm. 
We in trouble. We in trouble. We in trouble for our young people. Do you know who the role model for our young people is? Maybe not Jesus even. They have their own role model, I'm telling you. Well, let me do a quick application here. Look at verse 9. Look at verse 9. They set the mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walked through the earth. They tongue walk through the earth. When they speak, everybody listens to them. When those so-called celebrities tweet or put something on Instagram or wear a t-shirt with a blasphemy, I'm telling you, the person who did that t-shirt becomes a millionaire in the next hour. All the young people in the world before that. They turn walk from the world. Then they ask, why? Why do you need God? Well, people are resisting God, but they're following me. I can cough, everybody will cough at the same time. I can think for them. All the young people at the same time. Why do we need God? Well, after all, one voice equals one voice. It doesn't matter. There's no father, there's no mother. One voice equals one online voice. Wow. Where is hope? Someone said to me once, well, there's no need to insist. We need to give people time, you know, bit by bit. And then they will say, I said, that's your own gospel. The Bible says the time for salvation is today. That's your gospel. When you pull in someone from fire, you don't cuddle them on the back. Mm. You pull them out of fire. Oh, let young people not be too harsh, you know, in their own time. The one person said to me, why, why don't we let, we give our young people, we let them make a choice for themselves. I said, are you talking about God? He said, yes, they will make the choice about themselves. I said, what's the choice? Remind me of the, what's the choice. The choice is between God and Satan, between eternity with God and hell. Now, you're telling me, to let young people choose hell. Oh, oh, I've never thought like that. I say so. So we put our own gospel now to please people, to make people feel good about it. No. The Bible says, who has taught you to flee the wrath to come? Wrath is coming. Well, however much we love someone, if they die without Christ, they go to hell forever. Yeah. However much we love them. Yeah. What do we do about that? We wait until the day that we feel like, oh, no, I've finished my life. I can no longer serve God. There's nothing to do. Oh, God, take my life on a deathbed. Yeah. Oh, we make a bit of noise now. To make them feel uncomfortable, to make them that they are missing God, they need God. There's no salvation outside God. There's no time for jokes. Well, if I love my children, surely I will speak to them the way I'm talking to you now. So you do in the work of evangelism. You don't go just accepting everything, everything. Well, I'm too young now. Maybe I will consider in 20 years time. Tomorrow does not belong to you. Oh, yeah. A young man was assisting, was um, at a funeral service, and everybody was uh, mourning for the dead, and everybody was sad. And uh, the pastor was uh, giving a sermon talking about the blessed hope and. Uh, they need to receive Christ. You know, everybody was attentively, carefully listening, and the young man, with no reverence, no respect, was disturbing the service openly. Mm -hmm. Disturbing the service openly. Mm -hmm. And the pastor was inspired at the funeral service and said something unusual. Mm -hmm. If you want to receive Christ, I am prepared to pray for you. 
And some people came forward to pray for them. And the young man increased in noises and the noise was making. After the service in the evening, everybody heard that he died in an accident. Mm -hmm. God forever in eternity without God. Mm -hmm. Because of playing with God. We're not in the business of playing. The Bible said, knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. Mm -hmm. It is the understanding of the horror of living eternally without God mm -hmm. that commands our love yes. for the lost. Mm -hmm. Not because we want to feel good about making a drama about so-called evangelism and talk, you know. Increasingly, you see, go in the corner, see people talking to one person, Jesus died for you, and then they're filming themselves on YouTube. <laughs> to put on YouTube. What is that? Mm. Drama. Mm. Okay. Mm. He became very envious of the wicked. What was the wicked doing then? Pride served as their necklace, their eyes bulge with abundance, and they have more than heart could wish. A good friend of me once said to me, oh, you see these people, while we struggle to find solutions for small problems, these people, they always have minimum five solutions to every problem. They can just give it a phone call to the chief constable of police and put you into trouble. You go to the court with them, they will hire the best barrister in town. There's nothing you can do. Mm -hmm. They want a mortgage, we well, we'll call the chief executive for Barclays. Mm -hmm. They want a mortgage for the, for the child, easy. Just call someone executive at HSBC, easy. Mm -hmm. He said they seem to have solutions to everything. Mm -hmm. But they scoff. <laughs> Scoffing is one of the end time traits. You know that? The Bible says in the end time there will be scoffers. Mm -hmm. but it's not just scoffers as in laughing, no. It's scoffer as in mocking God mm -hmm. and seeking to, to fight and to destroy His truth in unrighteousness. They set their mouth against the heaven where God dwells and they question. Let's see that. Verse 11. And they say, how does God know? Hmm. Hmm. Is there knowledge in the most high? What kind of question is that? Hmm. Hmm. They question God omniscience hmm. and integrity. Yeah. Well, God doesn't even know what we're doing. Hmm. We can get away with it. One day, they will stand before Jesus Christ who will judge in righteousness and they will give account. Mm -hmm. but I've told you this story before. Uh, a brother who was committed to the, you know, um, the late Queen's uh, family chapel. And on Sunday, in the service, as they were praying and worshipping, the Queen was kneeling down. And the brother said, oh, when I saw that, I said, oh, it's true, Christ is the king of kings. Mm -hmm. One day, people will give an account mm -hmm. before God. But God is patient, desiring that no one should perish. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. If he had come on the 3rd of April, 2093, I would have been lost. Even today, God is waiting. People are coming to Christ through various means. People are coming to Christ. Leaflet, radio program, Bible, gifting, etc. God is good. Yes. In fact, we are commanded not to live carnally. 
but to set our mind on things from above. That's spirituality. To set our mind on things from above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father. It's been said we have we need to have our feet on the ground and our heart in heaven. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God to seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. To set our mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 2. That was lucky. This person here diverted their attention from things from above onto earthly things mm -hmm. and became angels and lost the perspective, the heavenly perspective of things. Mm -hmm. The blessed hope of the coming of Jesus Christ and the anticipation of eternal life with God is the only key to solving the puzzle of the faith. Dilemma. Mm. It's no other way. It's the looking beyond the grave. It's the expectation of the blessed hope. Jesus Christ coming, wiping away every tear from our eyes. Doing everything new. And living with us where sin will not have access. Mm. Where we are transformed, glorified, not to die again. In fact, not only will we see Christ, but we will be like Him. Amen. That takes us beyond carnality. Mm. And that is called faith. Mm. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith, not just for the sake of it, but laying hold of eternal life to which you were called. Carnality leads to wrong perception of the facade. Isaac's perception was now limited to appearances. Faith goes beyond appearances. Even in his terrible situation, Job said, I know my Redeemer. Though he slain me, I will still trust him. Radical faith. What about Daniel's companion? In the fiery furnace. Well, we know God will deliver, but even if he doesn't. Radical faith. What about the forefathers, the heroes of faith? They all died in faith without receiving the promises. Mm. What was the reason for that? Because they looked to the city mm. made by God. Mm. They did not regret where they had come from. Mm. Because if they did that, they would have returned there. No, mm. but now they were looking forward to the city made by God. Mm. Confessing, professing, we are strangers, pilgrims, and sojourners on this earth. Yes. We are passing. We are not home yet. That's what I'm telling you. The heavenly perspective means we go beyond carnality. Mm. How disastrous is the situation? No joy on believers. Because there's no money, enough money in the bank account. Because I have a bit of coffee. Fear, every time, fear. The Bible says we did not receive the spirit of fear. What is this thing about fear, timidity, worry, all the time? Yet the Bible says be not anxious. It doesn't mean you're not a human being because the next verse will help you. Cast all your care mm. on him, for he cares for you. Mm. Cares are real. Mm. 
Anxieties are real. But what do we do with them? We cast them to the Lord and we move with Him. Psalm 94 verse 19, I begin to forget it because I've quoted it so many times. John Hayward used to call that Giz Medicine verse. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comfort delights my soul. Anxiety is real, but your comfort is there to counter those things because anxiety leads to depression. If you play with anxiety, oh, I'm strong, I'm good. I've got this technique, I can use this technique. Our beloved High Priest, who is able to sympathize. Well, that's one instance when I find where I find uh, the New King James, New King James version to be slightly weaker than the authorized version. Yeah, I might admit at least for now I don't really see the difference. But in the authorized version it says, "Who is able to understand the feeling of our infirmity?" It's extreme. God is able to help us and to understand the feeling, human feeling, of infirmities. That's our high priest. Why won't we go to him? We go to a bit of technique here, we read a bit of book here, a bit of misleading there. He doesn't do anything. As soon as we've read, sometimes we do a direct debit to pay for it, and things get worse. Christ's help is charge free. It's free of charge. He invites us all the time. Come, come, come boldly with assurance. Come and seek help. Because I know your situation. I know you. I know your frustration. I know your disappointment. I've been there. I've walked in the same street as you. I know you. I can help you. Come boldly to seek help. Why would we neglect that? Why would we put our trust in man? In empty philosophies? No. That's deceitful. That's deception. Come to God, who has the word of eternal life. Yeah. Well, it may not be clear at the moment who we are, but one day it will be revealed. Those who trust in Christ will live eternally with God. However good you think you are, however correct you think you are. In French, some people say, reglo, you think you are. It's not going to save anybody. Only by grace can we enter. So, carnality leads to wrong perception. The of perception was now limited to appearances. Wow, this is how he sees now things. The ungodly are always at ease. They are not in trouble as other people. There are no pangs in their death. Well, how do you know? How do you know there are not pangs in their death? Because when those people die, you're not there. All you see is the publicity in the media and this uh, very expensive funeral, that's what you see. But people who have witnessed the death of those people will tell you different stories. Search and see how Whitney Houston died in America. Yeah. Those famous people. Go and search how Michael Jackson, one of the most talented person, go and search. And you look from outside and say, oh, even their death is not nice. sweet. There's no bug in their death. Some people who are in Freemasonry, some of them get the bad section. Some of them. It's written in their books. Then they make a big publicity. They are horrified of death because they know what they're going to do to their body. Because of the agreement they've entered into. The devil is a deceiver. If the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Paul said to live is Christ, to die is again. And the Bible says, I think Psalm 1, 1, 16, verse, verse 15, or the other way around, 
precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. When we close our eyes, instantly we land into Jesus Christ. Instantly. The physical body will fail us a little bit, but the spirit inside is prepared to meet the one we've worshipped without seeing him. Continue persevering the Lord. One day you will understand. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. That is called faith. A great philosopher in France, uh, Jean Paul Sartre, you know, he was an existentialist. He, he said quite bad things about God. But uh, we've come across a tape that was secretly recorded about him where he said different things before he died mm -hmm. but that has been kept secret mm -hmm. I heard that many years ago I was in Burundi University it's been kept secret mm -hmm. because if people access that you would go okay but this man was saying if I exist God doesn't exist so is this what he said that is hidden Quite few famous people give their life to Christ sometimes, but that testimony is hidden because the devil doesn't want none. Anthony Flew was, uh, for six decades, one of the most famous atheist scholar. The, you know, the people who deny the resurrection of Christ. One of those theories is. Uh, hallucination, the theory of hallucination, mm -hmm. uh, stating that the disciple might have thought that they saw him, but was the father of that, for six years, well respected worldwide, mm -hmm. came to believe that there was God. Mm -hmm. Wow, the rich donkeys, they were like uh, very tiny compared to him. Mm -hmm. They respected him academically. In fact, he received a prize of the most honored academics who follow where evidence leads. <coughs> After searching for many years, he was convinced that God exists and Jesus Christ. <coughs> and acknowledged that, oh, suddenly he became ignorant. Oh, Richard Dawkins is ignorant, he's been intimidated. You can believe that. Such a fine mind. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. So long as someone is still in life, oh. they have an opportunity. Yeah. God will do all that it takes to save someone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And God will never be accused. Even on the cross. Mm -hmm. One was rebellious. Mm -hmm. One was praying to God mm -hmm. to save him. Mm -hmm. God will wait. And there is hope. As long as people live. Mm. The inner conflict. Mm. Verse 13. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hand in innocence. This passage could well summarize Job's thinking. How can God declare me to be his upright servant? yet allow such terrible suffering to overtake me. You see this declaration here? Complete despair. Surely, in vain, I have cleansed my heart. Where? Our young people, some, if not all of you, you decide to serve God, to follow God. There is a cost, and you are paying that cost. Because you follow God. You live a disciplined life. You obey God. You confess when you've sinned, when you've sinned. You flee from evil. You sustain the good fight of faith in your generation. It's tough. And God does not pretend, nor do I. 
But because of peer pressure, you may begin to think, why am I keeping myself pure? What's, you know, everybody's doing it. I'm wasting my time. All these prayers, and why? Everybody's doing it. Here is your answer. Look to God. Amen. Look to God. Other young people have been there before. Joseph in Egypt. He fled. In front of some sin, you don't need to pray, you need to flee physically. Yeah, that's true. Verse 16 to 17. The inward conflict can be embarrassing, personal. Asaph tried hard to understand this apparent contradiction, but unsuccessful. He was completely miserable. In verse 16, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. It's impossible. I spent a lot of time to understand this. It was a hard reality. This tells us that human reasoning could not help discerning or provide a fulfilling answer to all the questions. Jesus was certainly, by the work he's done, a learned, intelligent person. But he was stuck. Human reasoning cannot resolve or give all the answers. It's impossible. Because God things are not discerned carnally, mm -hmm. they are discerned spiritually. Mm -hmm. Some of the answers we will only find them in God. Mm -hmm. And when we find an answer in God and God revealed to us, it gives peace and happiness and boldness mm -hmm. and faith we increase and trust in God and we continue. And then, when we exhaust all our hope and resources, we give, we give, we give, we give to continue. Mm. Trust in God. Day by day is important. Mm. But when Asaph entered the sanctuary, now in verse 17, there is a shift, there is a big change. Something has happened in verse 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then, bingo, mm -hmm. I understood the end of the people I was envying were the ones that end at all. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. It changes the perspective of everything. Mm -hmm. Because I now understand what is my destiny, what is their destiny. I don't want that destiny. Mm -hmm. Because God has revealed to him now. Verse 18 to 20, the wicked are set in slippery place for destruction. Remember that song? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All other ground is sinking sand. But look at that verse there. Verse 18. You set them in slippery place. It's false security. Mm -hmm. That's their own reward. The acclamation, the appreciation of men is their own reward. Mm -hmm. Then destruction awaits them if they don't repent and believe in Jesus Christ and receive freely his salvation. Mm -hmm. Remember, The story of Lazarus versus the rich man or the wicked rich man. Mm. Mm. In Luke 16, I think it is. The two of them, this is, this is not a parable. This is a true story because they are names. Parables have no names. Mm. They found themselves... Oh, someone is checking me out. That's good. It's Luke 16, verse 20 to 25. They found themselves in the Hades. In French, dans le séjour de mort, where the dead people are. 
they found themselves there. Before Christ's death and resurrection, there was only one place called the Hades or the Sheol, the Sejo de Mort. But that place had two sections. One section was called the place of torment, la place le lieu de torment, and the other one was called Abraham's bosom, a place of rest. The weak, the, 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 the Lazarus, the poor Lazarus, was resting and being comforted in Abraham's bosom. Mm. The wicked rich found himself in the place of torment. <coughs> he lifted up his eyes, which suggested to me that the place of torment is deeper. <laughs> he lifted up and say, Father Abraham, oh, what the reverence, Father Abraham, water, if you could just dip your finger, I just need a drop of water to cool my door, it's so burning in here, and then what? Can you send someone, because I have brothers, can you send someone to go and warn them? This is a terrible place, so that they should not come here. Are you serious? Says Abraham. Are you serious? Yes! If someone comes from here, they will believe. They won't. They won't. Those who believe, believe on the basis of the gospel. Believe on the simple basis of what Moses has written, the prophet has written, the fulfillment of it in the New Testament, which we call the Gospel. Mm. They just need to believe that. There's no special provision for people. Mm. Well, believe and make it so accommodating, mm. customized outreach. This is a rich person that there was someone, something a few years ago, many years ago actually, was called Full Gospel. It came from America. They say it's for rich people, the important people, who, can, who, are, who feel uncomfortable to gather with the wretched ones. Let me see how. They need a special place in a luxury hotel with a big meal because they are important people with special version of the Bible. They call it full gospel. That's the only way we can reach them. Well, that was that was that man was asking Abraham to do. You know. Now the Bible now they need a special envoy from hell to come and tell them. They go, no, 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 no. They have Moses and the prophet. If they do not hear them, even if someone comes from here, they will not. We just deceiving ourselves in trying to make it look nicer for people, you know, to come up with something that's accommodating. There's only the gospel. It's called the gospel of salvation. Mm -hmm. Those who believe are saved, those who reject are lost. Mm -hmm. We can fabricate whatever we want to fabricate to make people happy, but that's not godly. Mm -hmm. In the conversation, the wicked rich man wanted to set his own rule for salvation. Send someone from the dead to speak to my brothers and they will repent. Abraham replied, If they do not hear Moses and the prophet, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Luke 16, verse 31. Didn't Jesus Christ come back from the dead? Mm -hmm. Who listens? Mm -hmm. False gospel. Mm -hmm. Jesus came from the dead. Mm -hmm. He introduced himself in the book of Revelation. I was dead, now I live. Mm -hmm. And he speaks to people, people still reject. So that man was lying. Mm -hmm. In verse 20, 21 to 28 of our main reading, 21 to 28, 
Thus my heart was grieved and was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast. That's the carnality I've been talking about. He was reasoning like someone who has no spirit. He was limited to what he was seeing with his eyes. I was like a beast. That's carnality. Wrong perception. But that is a realization. It's a return to reason. It's a turning point. It's a going back to God, the Creator, because He realized that He was wrong. It's a realization of one's foolishness and ignorance, followed by what? Followed by the assurance and security in God. It is an affirmation of obedience, submission, and trust in the Lord. You see, he begins to say things about God now. God has given him a revelation. He said, I know you will continually hold my hand. Mm -hmm. Whom else do I have in heaven but God? Mm -hmm. You see, that realization, that affirmation, that repentance, leads him to more fellowship with God now. He can now appreciate the goodness and faithfulness of God. Rather than continuing in error, he is coming back. That is what I call backsliding. For me, backsliding doesn't mean you've lost salvation. This is a backslidden person who has come back. A backslidden person is someone who is saved, has slipped, has diverted, has been deceived, but very quickly comes back to God, mm. like Samson. Mm. You may be thinking, what's the alternative then? I know people like those things. I don't. Losing salvation, eternal security, one seven. I don't, I don't like that. I don't understand those things. I'm just going by what is written here. What's the alternative then? What about those who go and not never to come back? That is called the falling away apostasy. Falling away is different from backsliding. Samson came back to reason, mm. to what God has called him to. But if someone lives and goes forever, they were never saved in the first place. Mm. With which authority am I saying that with so much assurance? Turn to, don't turn to it, you can write it down. I'm going to read it for you here. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were of us. Us. That's not losing salvation. They will never believe us in the first place. This helps us understand the difficult passage in Hebrews 4, verse 6, or the other way around, I think it is. <clears throat> yes, Hebrews 6, verse 4. It is impossible for them to repent again because they've been this, they've tested the, the, the power to come, etc. All those things does not mean losing salvation. They've been in the church, they've heard people speaking in tongue and prophecy, some of them have been even healed supernaturally, they've heard the word of God, they've heard those things, but because the word they received was not mixed with faith, they left. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What about Jesus Christ? On that day, many will say, Lord, we have done this for you. I will say, I have never knew you. Mm. Those are the people we're talking about. That's not losing salvation. Mm. They never saved in the first place. 
Because John said, they were not of us. They were with us, but not of us. Mm -hmm. That's why they left. But we continue. Mm -hmm. We do not go back into perdition. We persevere toward the end. Because the seed of Christ, eternal life, is in us. Mm -hmm. So Asaph was a backslidden who came back very quickly to God and rejoiced in the goodness of God. You find the same confirmation in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, they were all baptized in Moses, they were all led by God. But they perished. The heart was still in Egypt. But they saw all those things. They tested of the power to come, all those kind of things, which symbolizes the baptism of the Holy Spirit, etc. They saw all those things. And they went back. They were part of the people of God, but their heart was not in God. As simple as that. Then, why am I saying this? Because believers need to be established in the faith. You've been saved by God unto eternal life. If you've been truly saved, your life is secure in Christ, in the Father. Who will go to heaven to bring you down? Even the devil cannot do that. If you've given your life to Christ, you love him to the end. The Bible says, who shall separate us from the love of God? Who? Mm -hmm. It makes people feel good, you know, those uh, empty discussions. It makes people feel good, feel scholar, but they're not biblical. Mm -hmm. oh. And we need courage to say those things. Mm -hmm. Well, who are you, Guy? That's not what Yaakov Prash thinks. Well, I'm not talking about Yaakov Prash. I'm talking about the Bible. We head into our conclusion now. Heavenly hope is the key factor to solving the puzzle of the faith dilemma. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16. Hebrews 11, verse 13 to 16. They all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers, pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now, they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's the key to solving the person. Look. Heavenly words. Mm. Heavenly words. Look beyond the grave. Mm. Look beyond the material to Christ. Mm. Conclusion. The conclusion is just a simple reading from Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. Hebrews 10, 35 to 39. Mm. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Mm. This conclusion is also an exhortation to all of us. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, mm -hmm. for you have need of endurance, mm -hmm. so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Mm. Listen carefully. Verse 39. Mm. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Mm. That's the definition of a true believer. Mm. He's saved, he continues to believe because he knows. His soul has been saved. Mm -hmm. He's not standing on the fence. No. Mm -hmm. Christ, 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 and Christ alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We bless the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. And then Christy will close the service.
the final service of the year, gratefully to God, as we commit our heart to the Lord. Let's pray while Chris is coming to close the service with a song. Heavenly Father, we bless you. Help of the helpless, abide with us, O oh God. Yes, Lord. We want to trust you, Lord. We want to continue. And by your grace, you will see us through. Mm -hmm. We here we commit our lives to you, O oh Holy Father. Because we know that you are faithful and able to keep that which we have committed to you until the day. Amen. Blessed be your name, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you command your blessing upon your people and the congregation here. While we reiterate our thanksgiving, Lord, for all that you've done for us throughout the year. We commit each family here represented and those who are not here unto your holy hand. Pray for our young people, Lord. May you, Lord, command your blessing upon each one of them. And Lord, reveal your purpose for them, Lord. Amen. And visit them, Lord, according to the richness, Lord, of your glory. Lord, do not pass us by. Be the answer, Lord. Help us, Lord. Guide us, Lord, our great Jehovah. We are weak, but thou art mighty. Lead us, Lord, with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven. Praise and glory be given to you now, tomorrow, and forever. Mm -hmm. We look to you, Lord. Bless us, we pray. As we bless your name above all.